Ladies and gentlemen, our next guest in the Business Mind series today is a global thought leader, consultant, and speaker on the uh, subject of design of modern working, the future of work, and transformational change. None other than Mr. Jer Jeremy Scribbins, all the way from uh, Melbourne, Australia. He's been invited by leaders in Australia, in the UK, and across the world to work with their teams to work on some very important things in the corporate world at this point of time, which is to proactively change the relationship the employees have with their workplace so that they can become partners and co-create vibrant futures for themselves and their teams. Uh, his expertise includes modern working and the, um, the art of uh, managing change. Based on his vast experience, he has developed some very interesting masterclasses with some very um, intriguing names, um, which are call your people together to co-create co meaningful change, raise your people above the talent poverty line. I love that. And install appreciation cool. into the rhythm of modern working. Mr. Scrivens, it's a pleasure to have you today. No, thank you. The pleasure, pleasure's all mine. Thank you so much. Um, how are things in Melbourne, Australia? Yes, well, it's, uh, we're moving into winter now and, and uh, there's an election coming up, a federal mm -hmm. election coming up uh, tomorrow. So we'll see that which, which way that goes. Uh -huh. I, so that as, like as the, as the weather's turning cold, that things are heating up on the political scenario, right? Weather, weather's, <laughs> turning, weather's turning a little bit cold, so uh -huh. you know, log fires are on. Of course, we, we're in Melbourne, so uh, it's not quite the same as Sydney. We don't have yeah. quite the the weather there or other parts but yeah it's all good mm -hmm. i um, moved to sydney australia in 1999 as a young student and in august july or august and that happens to be the hottest and the most humid month in the entire year <laughs> in north india so much so our humidity levels were usually touched around 90 95 percent and uh, land landed in sydney and it was it was cold right but i like this sydney winters in the sense that they're not too extreme very nice and australian winters in general and and um, so lovely to have you on the show today. And, and let, yeah, let, let's um, let's jump right into it, into the subject of our discussion today. And I want to talk about um, um, the subject in which you're a global thought leader, the future of work. And we're all curious on what it looks like. Um, we there is there is no definite sort of um, picture, clear picture emerging. Is it going to be hybrid? Will we go back to the old way? Uh, and I mean, in what amalgamation, in what new avatar will the future of work emerge and how do business leaders lead to change and to adapt to this scenario? Well, I, I think it's interesting, isn't it? I think these times now, we live in right now, I'm talking about literally 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, will the, the, the sort of people who write the books, you know, and, and the textbooks and stuff, yeah. you know, in 20 years time, we'll see this as a seminal uh, period. They'll we'll see this mm -hmm. as a, a change in the zeitgeist, mm -hmm. if you like, or the spirit of the times when it mm -hmm. comes to work. You know, we've had a 300 year old industrial model of work, which has True. been the predominant way of thinking about work for now mm -hmm. for well for that period of time. And that 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 model is is really focused on uh, work as as the concept of, of an organization as, 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 as a building as a workplace. Mm -hmm as a job description. So in 1978, all that year, those years ago, when I started as, as, an, as an HR intern oh, wow. in the Commonwealth Public Service, mm -hmm. I was given a job description mm -hmm. and then a number in the Oracle payroll system. So that, that made me come alive. <laughs> so I, I didn't exist until I was given a job title, right. a job description. Mm -hmm. And that job description took a fraction of Jeremy, took a fraction of who Jeremy really is mm -hmm. and took that into play. And I think for for many years, people have put up with that, right? You know, and and tw fifteen years ago, twelve years ago, when I wrote my first tweet, mm. uh, sitting on a, on a beach in Hawaii with a very very sort of in, a very sort of influential ch American chairman of multinational companies who was a passionate about Twitter, mm -hmm. and teaching me how to tweet for the first time, he said, "What do you really care about?" And I, mm -hmm. he said, "Write a tweet that really matters." And I wrote my first tweet, which is in, in the future of work, people will be engaged from the heart first, not mm -hmm. the head, mm -hmm. which is not the wow. way mm -hmm. that that's not the predominant model even today. It's not the predominant model. It's not. Mm -hmm. You know, Gallup, for example, the Gallup Group, who's Probably their greatest contribution globally has been they're mm -hmm. the ones that did so much on the engagement surveys and right. employee engagement. They're the ones that came up with this idea that, that the most engaged people in the world, still only about a fraction of the population, mm -hmm. like work fit 10, 12, 14%, mm -hmm. are first engaged from the heart. 
Yeah. If you like, I call that from, from who they are and why, not right. the head, which is the how and the what. And, uh -huh. and right now, if you, look at, just, just, if you look at digital transformation, for example, yeah. transformation is not a new word, but you think it was. But the new tech at the moment has, has got so much potential, but it needs to engage the heart as well as the head. True. It needs to engage the story as well as the data. And I think that a lot of my work now is actually recognizing that there's a need to, to reframe the conversations around change. Uh -huh which sees technology as not just a static thing or, or around the head, but also engages the heart right. to make the world a, a better place. Yeah, now that's interesting what you said about the Gallup numbers, and they are worrying at the same time. I mean, if, if we have maybe less than 10% of the world's population as in people who are engaged at their workplace, that means roughly, you know, roughly about 80% uh, either actively disengaged or disengaged means either they're bored yes. or not interested, or even worse, that they are working to undermine what their colleagues are doing. So I can just, uh, if, if we just double those numbers, you know, see the amount of productivity <laughs> increase, see the amount of innovation, the ownership and all these things that everybody strives for. And they, they speak about it too. You know, every company espouses these values. They publish it on their bulletin boards, on their web portals. They print yes. out t-shirts with these messages. They have retreats and conferences. They invite speakers like my motivational speakers like myself, fire troops up, you know, one team and <laughs> we're, we're there for each other. And yet somewhere, yeah. and yet somewhere, somewhere, what happens on a day-to-day -day basis, there's a huge mismatch in what leaders want to achieve, um, they strive towards it, they talk about it, and yet the ground level practices are way different. Where do you see, um, Mr. Scrivens, this mismatch is emerging from and how do maybe for a leader, for let's say somebody who's come with good intentions today to say, hey, I want to create a workplace which empowers people. I want to create a workplace where people feel excited to get to work. But he's inherited or she's inherited a bureaucratic old model of work. How does this person go about making that change so that what they speak is actually, it results in something ground level changes? Well, I've been asked that question a number of times uh -huh. from leaders mm -hmm. in the last two to three years, particularly during COVID because the pandemic has brought the future of work forward now. Mm -hmm. uh, we've all heard of the great resignation, right? Yeah. Um, it's not just a phenomenon that's existing in America. Um, you know, McKinsey have written about that, but uh, the National Australia Bank here produced a report in Australia uh -huh. two months ago that said that something like 25 to 30% of, of the workforce mm -hmm. will voluntarily leave their jobs in 2022 but they then said why, and it was mm -hmm. exactly the same reason that McKinsey mm -hmm. said in their in their research, which mm -hmm. was the number one reason why people are leaving work now, is so they can go and find those managers and leaders and organisations that mm -hmm. will enable them to work to their personal why, mm -hmm. the right fit for them. But yeah. but also allow every individual, I believe personally, every individual is born with a unique purpose. Sure. Uh, every individual is meant to lead a life of contribution where mm -hmm. they can work to share and to create their own story, choreograph mm -hmm. their own dance, mm -hmm. uh, like that. write their own song, mm -hmm. but also to do that in collaboration with others. That way, that's what that way you get an orchestra. Mm. But the old school says there's a, an orchestra conductor, and mm -hmm. the, and that or orchestra conductor is the manager. And the mm -hmm. manager has been taught to reduce variation. So the industrial model, you know, Six mm -hmm. Sigma Lean, all these process improvement tools of the mm -hmm. 90s, which I was steeped in, mm -hmm. um, focused on, on, on reducing variation. So here we are now. And what are some of the buzzwords we're seeing now? Mm -hmm. um, we want managers to uh, identify diversity, right? to, in, to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. Every individual is different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yet, this is the opposite of reducing variation. This is actually right. releasing variation, right. the variation in people. So mm -hmm. in a nutshell, I began to do, write some courses and started to work with organizations and leaders in the last two or three years to try and make sense of this and, and ask questions, what are the key topics that really matter to people now? Mm. And I think what's happened is that, that the people, not everyone, of course, but quite a number of people, as you would know, with COVID, we got out of the building, mm. back into our homes long enough to move into a reflective mode. Mm -hmm. Long enough to take time out to ask questions like, what is my single truth mm. that's emerging now? And these are not silly questions. They're actually mm -hmm. questions which even Forrester's research shows recently that the single question that Generation 
Zs are asking now around the workplace is, will you help me manager or leader to help me to discover truth? Now, mm. th just think about this for a second. How many mm. leaders have been taught how to have that kind of conversation mm. with their people? <laughs> They're ill-equipped to do that, right? I'll go, are yeah. you kidding me? Uh, Serious? What, what <laughs> right. <laughs> That's, yeah. <laughs> but you see, these, these are important times. Climate change, the kind of issues facing the world yeah. are macro changes, uh -huh. but they're also individual. So the technology at its best now is, is doing this. It's, it's, it's attention. Technology is allowing us to do things at scale. Sure. But it's also allowing, allowing us to be more intimate with other people mm -hmm. to make a difference together. Definitely. I think that sweet spot is something that's, 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 that's very important. Right. I did a bit of research um, last year well in fact the last six months uh -huh. take a step back over, over a weekend actually and just see what are the topics that really matter to people now what jumped on the old google and just started to ask these questions what's mm. meaningful now How, mm. what's what's future work what's hybrid work and there were six topics that came out okay and and stood out as being critical mm -hmm. um and so i put those into the courses i'm now working with leaders now mm -hmm. the first one was was meaning and purpose we've just touched on that right sure. this idea that McKinsey wrote a blog. It's a fascinating blog last year where they where they got a bit. That's his McKinsey, right? And mm -hmm. and and the Seven S crew, right? Great people. Okay. But they wrote a blog saying the number one reason why people are resigning for work, the Great Resignation, is because they want meaning and purpose, and they want to discover their personal why and to work to their personal why. And they said, mm -hmm. you know what? Mm -hmm. The next generation of leaders need to know how to engage their people in a conversation around their personal why. And then McKinsey. Right concluded that they don't know how to do it mm. they haven't been trained now for it. that's that's the space i'm working in now because yes right. it's not that hard to do but it, it requires a shift mm -hmm. from what i call the leader as hero with the experts in the room to leader as host of, of a set of different conversations with their people as equal players in in in, in the work to, to sure. reimagine vibrant futures which bring the best of me hashtag mm -hmm. individual mm -hmm. and the best of we some some organizations are moving now beyond Organize, static organizations, uh, silo single organizations mm -hmm. to living ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And those ecosystems are the new agile. Yeah. And they're made up of individuals who, who, who feel a sense of community and belonging because they're able to, to, to have conversations around their personal why sure. in ways then that connect with other people's personal why. So that was the first thing, meaning and purpose. Right. Um, and I think secondly on that one, I, uh, in terms, we can unpack some of these, but that second mm -hmm. one is also about uh, equipping leaders to know how to engage their people in the conversations to co-create the future. Okay. Not just have those people as the recipients of change, but mm -hmm. as co-change makers of right. the future. Participants, right. Mm -hmm. You know, as equal players in the work. And so, so that goes back to your point yeah. earlier on in our conversation where Gallup has shown that only a fraction of the talent and creativity and innovation mm -hmm capability that exists in organizations is actually is actually being deployed because we, right. we don't engage it yep. now is the time to do that right it's a shame um, that, we so that was been... the first one meaning meaning and purpose and right you know that that is such a powerful uh, uh -huh. powerful conversation to have for leaders to be equipped to have with their people right and i um so what i get from what you just said and thank you for sharing those meaningful pieces of research uh, coming from different publications uh but what i understand is um, there's a big chunk of people out there who have voted against the traditional workplace or the traditional methods and they've done it by resigning and now they're out there they they are looking for something that fits their mindset that suits to their um vision and what they want to do and their values right and they're out there looking for it and in turn they're demanding so this is a great reset for for the workplace in a way and it's 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 a time when business leaders should no longer ignore the individual or cannot afford to ignore the individual in the equation any longer it's not about machines or and capital anymore it's a, it's also about the individual and what they stand for right but just on that yes you're absolutely right i mean you, you and i both know that we are intimate with the gallup work as you know uh -huh. and uh, you know there, there are other people who've done great work there but you mentioned the three you know, sort of classic sort of um, levels of engagement mm -hmm. that kind of talk about, you know, mm -hmm. engaged, not engaged, dis uh, disengaged. I actually call those, I called those some years ago, the contributors, the compliance, the subversives. Oh, right. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the subversives are the ones that actively, um, they're the terrorists, they're the internal members of, of they're, they're the internal terrorists, you know. Mm -hmm. And 
because I adopt a strength-based approach in my work now, you know, adopting a priestly inquiry and positive psychology and looking for what works and how to extend what works, looking for the causes of light rather than looking for the, how we can switch on the light so the darkness recedes, mm-hmm. not, mm-hmm. not focus on the causes of darkness. You know mm-hmm. nothing about light from studying darkness. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that until, 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 until recently. Mm. But, you know, we, we talk about, don't we, in, in, uh, for years with organisations around how you've got this sweet spot, which is the, that middle part, which is those not engaged people, not, mm-hmm. not, the, dis, not the totally disengaged or subversives or the contributors or engaged, but, the, but, the, but they're not engaged. And that not engaged has always been about 60 to 70% of the workforce, yeah? Mm-hmm. Um, and yet, so I call them compliant. And yet the reality is that organizations and managers have got away with not engaging that compliant group for mm-hmm. years. Mm-hmm. We can no longer do that now. They will, those, those, the, the, those, those people, those thousands of people in the organizations who are sitting there, who were happy to, to go to work nine to five, mm-hmm. something has shifted, something they've got out of the building, they've got into their homes, they've reflected on the fact they no longer want to be compliant. They've mm-hmm. discovered something more. Mm-hmm. And the foreman who are trying to round them up to go back into the building mm-hmm. can't do it. Yeah. <laughs> because that world has changed. Mm hmm. But if you took that into, a, if you take that to a very positive, I'm excited by this because if you take a positive view of this, there's a whole bunch of people out there who are now ready for a different level of engagement. Right. But the conversations have to be equalised. So we talk about mm-hmm. we talk about equity at work. We talk about true inclusion. Mm-hmm. True inclusion means to elevate the status of people so they can also feel ownership of the work in the workplace. And it's not actually about the workplace. That's the, that's the, that's the, that's the how bit. Mm-hmm. It's really about the contribution we're going to make yeah. to make the world a better place mm-hmm. together as a collaborative community. And I think, you know, I'm confident there are enough leaders out there who, um, who want to do that. Uh, I, I do know most of them don't know how to do it. In the same way Gallup, you know, talked about how the, you know, Gallup put strength finders together 20 mm-hmm. years ago because mm-hmm. they discovered that the world's, the world's greatest managers, you know, Kaufman and Buckingham uh, uh, and Kaufman's books on, you know, what the world's greatest managers do differently. Well, mm-hmm. what they do, they take the time out to engage the individual talent. And, right, this right. And they, they, mm-hmm. did in, they did instinctively, but mm-hmm. most managers needed a tool or to be equipped to do that. And right. that, that's the, kind of the space I'm trying to, to work in now, as you are, I know, this space of, Equipping the leaders and managers, come on, don't be frightened by this. Mm-hmm. Don't be scared by it. Mm-hmm. Um, I know it's a bit scary because it's a bit unknown, but there are ways that you can, which you can engage your people, and it's not that hard. In fact, you'll find it's actually quite an exciting thing to do. But I think there's a gap in the in the mm-hmm. you know in our infantry now, which we need to fill. Sure. No, and and I, I just it just emerged while you were mentioning these different categories. You called the category number three the actively disengaged folk, uh, folks as uh, the subversive ones, and you know we we have this. And I think at at the same time, I I would my from my personal opinion there, and perhaps you could you might have a different one, and I respect that. Is that leaders should not get caught up in these uh, titles, in these um, descriptions, because um, the yeah. the so called maybe subversives or the um, actively disengaged folks are actually actually smart people out there. They're on a mission, but that mission is very different from your mission, from the leader's mission or the company's mission. They're on a different sort of mission and that something happened along the way. They did not join the organization to undermine what their teams are achieving or to undermine what the organizations are achieving. Something happened afterwards. And I think that should be a moment that every leader should reflect on what's wrong in my organization culture, what's wrong with the uh, workplace climate here that is pushing people to work against each other rather than for each other. So maybe there's a communication gap, maybe maybe there's a bureaucratic way of functioning, maybe new ideas are, are not welcomed and not implemented and people are feeling left out so I think uh, these are also opportunities for self-reflection. Would you? Would you? What are your views on that? Uh, a little while back, I, I was given the challenge by a leader uh-huh. um, to work with their people that they had, according to it's a very, very so well-known uh, survey engagement tool in Australia. I won't mention the name, but uh, but they had come up with this group of they were the uh, council inspectors who were mm-hmm. rated as the most disengaged group in Australia by okay. far. Okay. All right. Uh, and the council had tried all sorts of things. And they said, if you can do something with these guys, well, mm-hmm. you know, and I, of course, I love, always love a challenge. But I just went, sat down with them and, and, and I asked them this question. I reframed, you know, the question mm-hmm. to, 
John, Mary, Fred, tell me, I, it, took me it took a little bit of time to do this to build mm -hmm. a relationship, but mm -hmm. tell me about the one time you felt most alive mm -hmm. in your work. What mm -hmm. was the one time you went home? Mm -hmm. I know you got, I know you don't like your job. I know mm -hmm. you don't feel engaged. I know mm -hmm. all that stuff. I get it, mate. Mm -hmm. But what was the one time you went home that you felt you made a contribution that day and you felt your job mattered even only for a moment? Now, right. Now you sit back and when you shut up and ask those questions and listen, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Something and they and this, these guys told me this these most extraordinary stories of wow. of, of how they collaborated to, to find mm -hmm. homes for homeless people. They oh, were wow. there as as yep. So they, mm -hmm. they were on the streets and they were doing tickets, giving issuing out tickets mm -hmm. and that sort mm -hmm. of stuff, mm -hmm. enforcing the local council bylaws. Mm -hmm. But the best stories they told of when they felt engaged was when they were able to help people who they found on the streets and find them a home, mm -hmm. or a young kid who was kicked out from school from right. work, so right. from home and had a tent and was hungry, and they found him a foster parent. Mm -hmm. Now this was not in their job description. It's not. Mm -hmm. You see, the the, the the engagement surveys will. We'll, we'll look at the job description. Sure. Not look at the humanness of someone. Right. And also, they said, and I said to them, so why, did, why are your engagement scores so low? Mm -hmm. They say, we didn't like the surveys. I said, why? Because mm. we didn't have a chance to ask the questions. Mm. The questions are given. Right. They felt left out. So fundamentally, they very good people. Out. Fundamentally, very good people. And in fact, they ended up, mm -hmm. uh, we used the priest inquiry to reimagine their work. Uh-huh. And the CEO was a very was a champion supporter. And the CEO was a champion supporter, so he came in and helped and worked with them. Right. And uh, the whole council came together in a, in a priest inquiry summit to reimagine their work, and they ended up winning an innovation award in Australia and local government, oh, wow. which was a really that, exciting. That's, that's a remarkable uh, turnaround. Yeah. That's a remarkable turn, yes. turnaround from, from from being presented to you as a challenge <laughs> to work with, to to turn around to be one of the most innovative groups, and 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 I think that just highlights the point that, as you already said, reframing is a powerful tool at how a leader can help the the team to look at a situation, right? And also uh, reframing open-ended questions, and then the courage and ability to listen and follow through, and I think. That's uh, really important, um, having a feedback. And the courage, as you mm -hmm. know, the courage to be vulnerable. The yeah. courage as the leader to say, I don't have all the answers. Uh -huh. um, I, I'm a little bit fearful of the future. Um, but, you know, because this is this goes back to high, you know, the adaptive leadership stuff, doesn't it? You know, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. versus, adaptive versus technical leadership. The technical yeah. leaders are those who are supposed to have all the answers. And, mm -hmm. and often uh, leaders... So we're moving in, in, in through a time of incredibly disruptive change, and that yep. change is adaptive because the adaptive change requires a change to how people think and how they mm -hmm. behave mm -hmm. and what their values are. So that means that you can't take that work off the people themselves. You've got mm -hmm. to engage them in mm -hmm. that work. Mm -hmm. uh, the new technologies are so powerful and with so much potential to do good at scale they are convergent technologies, which means they bring everything together. Whereas mm -hmm. the technologies that I was used to mm -hmm. were very much not convergent. They were single focus, single purpose technologies that, right. you know, were you know, HR or finance or customer uh -huh. service Segregated. or something. Yeah. yeah. And we spent 25 years doing system integration, didn't we? Trying mm -hmm. to bolt things together. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just think from the convergent question, mm -hmm. which is who are we? Mm -hmm. Why do we exist? Mm -hmm. What's, what is meant to be our true purpose in life? Mm -hmm. What's our best contribution? What if we bring more strengths in, in play to do more with more? What if we release the full potential? Mm -hmm. What difference could we make? And then how could we use the technology to inform the journey as well as help us to, uh, to take it? You know, that's the right order of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's when you really begin to tune in to what's happening and, you know, have that sort of connect with the people that you lead in order to for people to open up as well. And I think two or three things emerge very clearly before I move to my next question. One is about the reframing. Second is about the power of vulnerability, the power of listening. Um, and a third is about you cannot afford to ignore the individual anymore and their values and what they and their aspirations and what they stand for. It's not just about money anymore. I read it somewhere, you know, maybe Henry Ford's assembly line manufacturing system. That's that's where it all started, right? That's where it all started. Um, it's even written some that he, he he was quoted somewhere as saying, why is that every time I ask for a pair of hands and feet, they come with a mind attached? And that was the industrial model, industrial approach. And now we're saying, no, we need your mind. We need your originality. We need your diversity of thought. 
Um, so we're going back to the basics in a way. This reset is happening uh, in the education se sector as well. Here in India, we see a lot mm -hmm. of students for, so after high school, the equivalent of what is matriculation or 10th grade here, we have the 10, what we call the 10 plus one and the 10, 10 plus two here, two years before they go for their graduation, before they go to university. And a lot of this new trend has kicked in. A lot of students would get admission into schools. It's called a dummy admission where there is an arrangement and understanding between the, the student and the authorities that the, the student will not show up for physical classes, but will be granted a certificate based on their examination, but daily attendance is not required anymore. So if we look at it, that's, that's a warning sign. That's an alarm bell right there. Two of the most important years of a student's life, they now are choosing and parents are supporting it and schools themselves are supporting it. Say, fine, you don't show up for classes every day. You sit for the exams. If you clear, we'll give you the certificate. You go on for your higher studies. But these two years, you design your own curriculum. You study at your own pace. You pick your own tutors. You pick your own resources. And a lot of students are benefiting immensely from that because they're not bound by the commute. They don't have to show up in person. They, they're not bound by that physical geographical location anymore or the teachers or the curriculum. They're now free to explore. And I think if this is happening in education, we need uh, something parallel to it uh, in the corporate world also, where we also need a space where people can be free to explore and create and bring their authentic selves. Yeah, and that's that's one of the, just, that's one of the you know, what you talked about, the three, three, uh, particular courses that I've put together now mm -hmm. as, as a request for people mm -hmm. around the world to come up with three courses that really matter around this space. And, yeah. you know, one of them is called, you know, raising your people above the talent poverty line. Right. I like uh, that. For mm -hmm. belonging and, and mm -hmm. contribution. I've had the mm -hmm. privilege of working with, because I, I love technology, but mm -hmm. I love using technology for meaning. So one of the, mm -hmm. one of the trends in, in the research I did around meaningful topics that, that people care about now is meaningful technology. That is technology mm -hmm. that enables them to, uh, to be freed from mundane work, right? To be released, to do creative, creative work and collaborate uh -huh. for social good and those sort of things. Um, and that's why, of course, why it's so important to work for leaders and organizations who get this. I call that second stream, which is the use of the technology to augment and lift people up. And uh -huh. I'll be using a piece of kit called, Brilliant Fit, which is a digital talent dashboard. It's a really okay. powerful uh, piece of kit. It brings up, identifies everyone's natural wiring. It was originally developed by um, by uh, Lee Ellis, who was shot down in Vietnam and spent four years in Hanoi Hilton. He Amer was American um, uh, Air Force uh, and, uh, fighter pilot and, and psychologist who became uh, a global a head of fighter pilot training in the U.S. Navy okay. and and became the first in the world to to switch the focus from uh, fitting Jeremy to the plane to mm -hmm. fitting the plane to Jeremy, mm -hmm. and and you know single seater, you know, single reframing. Some people are naturally yeah. wired around single seater, single you know me sort of stuff. Right. Whereas whereas you know uh, whereas others uh, want a buddy. You know the famous first Top Gun video. Mm -hmm. Maver Maverick really was a me person, whereas his mm -hmm. buddy wanted to, to to be a we mm -hmm. sort of um, you know type thing. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, I've been deploying that for, for, for um, uh, recently to identify the natural talents of every individual person and and to use the digital digital platform to engage conversations around how they can release all those talents for well-being, mm -hmm. for, um, for, for, for a sense of belonging, and to shift the conversation from only the manager being responsible for this conversation mm -hmm. to the team itself being, being, being responsible for collective well-being. Mm -hmm. And then to see how their, their, their combinations of, of strengths or talents can, can, can be put together to reimagine uh, modern working. And mm -hmm. so in other words, we actually, uh, I, I actually worked with an organization here called uh, back, back, uh, uh, back in Motion. It's a, it's, a, it's a health franchise that's okay. doubled in size in the last few years. Jason right. Smith, the CEO there, and he asked me to come in and work with him three or four years ago on some of the stuff. And, and, it, and the result is he totally abolished general manager positions in his organization, in his head office group, okay. and all job titles. He did it. We did a, We did a, what I call a talent equity stock take mm. of every single person in his head office group, wow. and then we got them in an appreciation inquiry sort of stomach room to reimagine and redesign their mm -hmm. head office structure oh, wow. around the collective talents and individual and collective grouping of talents of the whole team. Mm -hmm. So they then then came up with it, and they were then given the, the opportunity to reimagine their work mm -hmm. around their talents, and and they were given the freedom to have that kind of 
conversation, just as you mentioned before, those, those young people coming through education now, those mm -hmm. two years. Mm -hmm. The only difference now is that, that we're using the technology, uh, the digital, if you like, the d date of talent to be mm -hmm. able to uh, engage um, uh, people and managers to be able to have this conversation even better now. Mm -hmm. Sure. And I'm, uh, uh, Mr. Scribbins, I can clearly see you're very passionate about appreciative inquiry. You've, you've mentioned it a couple yes. of times. Yes. And uh, I'd love to hear from you during these times of disengagement, great resignation, automation, the threat of layoffs, so much happening, global economy is slowing down, the war in Ukraine, yes. so many other uncertainties, wheat supply yes. is being affected, and, you know, so so yep. many issues lingering out there. It's a challenging time for, you know, it's a, I mean, it's a time full of optimism and hope as well as as countries emerge from the pandemic and they're ready for action they, they, they you know they feel that they want to recover the losses or whatever might have happened uh, in the last two years but at the same time there's so many other threats you know it employees are resi resigning uh, in large numbers we've had a company a startup in india 800 employees resigned together in one go when they were asked to return back to the old model of work which was report well, uh, 9 a.m. for work in the head office, which was a very nicely designed millions of dollars spent on that building to ensure it's green and everything, open workplaces, blah, blah, blah. But people say, no, we're comfortable. We, we have aligned to the old model and, you know, we don't want to change. So uh, in, in these challenging times, how can appreciative inquiry, what, what, what are the certain principles or certain tools that a leader can use to maybe help navigate these situations? Well, the appreciative inquiry um, is 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 a is a set of tools and philosophy and, and, and approach for bringing, if you like, whole systems of people into the room uh -huh. to reimagine the future by spending time uh, on a, on an affirmative topic or strengths based affirmative topic that gives hope for the future. Okay, and we take time out to discover the best uh, rather than focus on the problem. We had, and so I spend a lot of my time with organisations now reframing the problem. Mm -hmm into a affirmative topic because that that then gives hope imagination and it frees people up mm -hmm. i actually believe uh deming deming said in the in the 1950s 60s with the quality movement mm -hmm. he said the role of a manager is to drive out fear mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i actually but that's an interesting concept and i love it but fear but we can spend time driving out fear uh -huh. or we can look for the opposite of fear which is love right and identify where love exists in our organization, in our ecosystem, mm -hmm. and our potential and invite potential partners around the world to spend time out looking for the best of in human systems, what gives life, what gives what gives hope, what gives what gives love. And when you engage people in those conversations, it's a healing process. Indeed. And it is an, a process that brings in inclusion and diversity. And it brings out the humanness in us. So we begin to rem remember that in order to, to solve the world's problems, mm -hmm. whether they be the world in terms of what we do with the partners in our business or whatever, or whether it be our town or our country or our industry mm -hmm. or globally, we are first and for foremost humans. Indeed. And what unites us is stronger than what divides us. But it's a conversation that needs to be re reframed. Mm -hmm to have that so we suddenly realize that you know we've all seen the conversations in the room haven't we where that there's we've all been on the zoom calls the last two or three years where we've seen the manager or the big boss no longer sitting in the big chair in the in the boardroom sitting at home in the t-shirt with mm -hmm. the cat running over the the, the, mm -hmm. the front and the mm -hmm. kids you know sort of jumping on his back mm -hmm. or her back and that's been an equalizer hasn't mm -hmm. it that's great equalizer. And this is what you're talking about this is the yeah. kind of 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 zeitgeist moment where people actually want to feel a sense of of yeah you're no better than me mm -hmm. I've actually got something to contribute and I think because they're feeling that in their home mm -hmm. if 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 we want if leaders want to get back into that multi billion dollar green building mm -hmm. I'm sure they can do that but it needs reframing the conversation mm -hmm. with their people mm -hmm. Indeed. about the things that matter. Mm -hmm. And when they, they, the people see the leaders engaging with them in the things that matter, mm -hmm. like how to make the world a better place, how not to rip off people, mm. <laughs> but how <laughs> to, to contribute, right. then they will be willing to come back to the building one or two days a week. But that's sure. the right order. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Could you give us an example, please, from one, one of your recent maybe clients that you worked with of, of this reframing process and maybe how, um, that, that helped people look differently? at the situation yes um uh, uh, 
the mushroom farm example where mm-hmm. we're working with the mushroom farm now it's a mushroom okay. farm was a, <laughs> only nice. 50 people not not the big you know not another seven eight hundred people i had in a room with say one of the australia's major corporates Olympic uh-huh. stadium in sydney right. with a water utility uh, some while back but this mushroom farm was you know and and it's uh, it's it's as you know we have our big corporates i think there's too much focus on big corporates mm-hmm. sometimes mm-hmm. Most people in the world don't work for big corporates. They right. work for small enterprises, like as you know, in India. Yep. And I think we forget that in the stories. Mm-hmm. I think too many of the stories are about the big players. Large what's corporations. Happening with the big, we get obsessed in the media about, you know, I won't name mention names. We all know who, know who they are. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with them. They're fantastic. But most of us don't work in those organizations. And, mm-hmm. and I think um, that sort of smallness becomes important. So the mushroom farm... I tell mm. the story very quickly. There's some blogs on this, but 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 Alan was the CEO. Right. Fantastic mushroom right. farm. Grew some of the best mushrooms in Australia. Uh, COVID hits. Struggles. You know, people not eating mushrooms as much. Even the uh, the supermarkets driving a price war down. Slashed his his his, his, his the cost the price of his markets overnight. His, his mushrooms overnight. Mm-hmm. I was due to go into an appreciation inquiry summit room with him the following week and have his 50 people in the room. Mm-hmm. Um, and due to have a time with him around re- reframing the conversation from the problem to the field mm-hmm. topic, but he jumped mm-hmm. on the call first and in a panic and shared that that was happening with his um, price of mushrooms. He said, look, I'm so pleased we're getting everyone in the room on Saturday morning, Jeremy, because we'll spend the whole day getting their ideas on how to take out cost. Okay. Mm. And I thought, really? Mm. And I said to him, so let me ask you this question, Alan. So when you're 30 years, 30 years from now, you sold your, your, your beautiful mushroom farm, and you got your... Uh, your gorgeous granddaughter or grandson on your knee and he or she looks up to you and says, mm-hmm. Papa, you did something wonderful with your life. Will mm-hmm. you turn around and say, yes, darling, I spent my whole life taking out cost. Mm-hmm. Is that your life contribution? Mm-hmm. And, and he sort of, he sort of, he sort of muttered a few words and I said, you're shooting the messenger. <laughs> and I said to him, what was the one time? So this is a, see, I, the word crisis mm-hmm. means two things. It means the turning point in a disease or, disaster right it also means a time to change the conversation around what is vital Mm. or what Mm. gives life vital what gives life we haven't done that managers hunker down they 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 try and survive but the growth conversation is not the survival conversation Mm -hmm. the growth conversation looks to identify what gives life right so the word vital means what gives life? Mm-hmm. So I said to Alan, what is the one time in your time you thought you'd love to leave a legacy that you could share with your grandkids about the contribution you've made? And it took a bit of coaching, as you can imagine, but he mm-hmm. came out and said that how he and his wife had always wanted to do something about the obesity levels of kids in Australia. He was worried about that. Okay. And I, so I explored it. I said, so, so, so what? what's your dream he said my dream is we can somehow get into the schools and we've got in there and we've created a new market of course but that's mm. not the me that's the outcome not the reason the reason is we'd be reaching these kids that will be eating healthily and that means we're doing something to mm-hmm. equip the next generation right and i went wow mm-hmm. so to cut a long story short on monday on the saturday morning in the cold wet morning he got up in front of his 50 people including young thai women going to university Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, engaged as pickers, including young African Somali laborers, mm-hmm. and he shared that passion, that vision. He said, We've got a business problem, but he shared this vision of it going to the schools. And we used the priest to inquiry right. as a conversation yeah. to unpack mm-hmm. the strengths mm-hmm. around life and what gave life, and then to actually get them to reimagine and create a whole new innovative way. They actually developed uh, the, the world's first colored mushroom growing kits to go into the schools. Interesting, right? Wow, that's yeah, good, and good and story. and in that in that room, as co-creating that with the with the African laborers and the uh, uh, the young Thai pickers, who also couldn't contain themselves any longer, they went into their mobile, they went into their room, into their lockers, got their mobile phones, and said, "We've got a digital app, we've got s- social movements, and I call thought social room, and we've got analytics." And then the young were teaching the old about what was new and this whole lot came together and finally the the, the accountant yelled out in the team and we bypassed the supermarkets there was a big cheer mm. oh wow now oh, wow. that is that was that was that was not the corporate world i come from uh-huh. that was a mushroom farm right right and yet these 50 people were engaged the first time as equal players and they switched the conversation from being crushed by the weight Cost. of COVID and the weight of right. of, of a price right. cut uh-huh. to reimagine the future which they themselves could take charge of well, that's a wonderful story there so something so from what was an existential threat 
and where, where the focus was entirely on uh, what do we do with the cost, uh, you flipped it. Yeah. The principle of appreciation inquiry says that which we want, what we want to see more of already exists. Ah, it's already there. Right? But we have to shift from uh -huh. looking for, for look, looking at the dirt mm -hmm. to uncovering the diamonds covered by the dirt. That's beautiful. And I, was, I always speak about this as the, I tell leaders that you have pockets of excellence already within your organization. Yes. Your job is yes. how to A, identify them, strengthen them, and then share them with the rest of the organization. So because they're role models, they're people doing, they're performing to high levels of excellence already existing. And those are your ambassadors and champions of change. Well, for example, you mentioned the 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 you know what's happening with Ukraine at the moment, mm -hmm. and I think all our hearts go out there. Yeah. Um, but there was I read an article in the BBC yesterday about the global food crisis. You know mm -hmm. that we've got the financial crisis and the global the stock markets are wobbling again. Mm -hmm. They said that's nothing compared to what's going to happen or could happen in the next few months with a shortage of, of food. There could mm -hmm. be a significant global. Indeed. And he said, no, we've got we've got all these all these resources being tied up in the hands of four major corporations globally, mm -hmm. almost like a cartel. He said, we need to come up with new ways to reimagine how we do the supply of food. Mm -hmm. So I thought, yes, that's the example of, of where we, the leaders will come together who will reframe the conversation from mm -hmm. this is a problem. So mm -hmm. you, you don't, what's the word, you don't um, ignore the problem, you identify the problem, yep. but you reframe it. Uh -huh. into an opportunity for growth. And then you open up. So so appreciation inquiry is what I call collaboration without borders. Oh, wow. Mm. And it, it, it helps people look at the big picture, right? And rather than the immediate operational threat or the me immediate thing that's on the horizon, it helps them look far into the future, a vision to aspire to. I'm reminded of what Howard Schultz said about Starbucks. He said people need something larger than themselves to believe in, right? And so it's not just about a place where we sell coffee. I think they have this motto there which says, we're not in the coffee business serving people, we're in the people business serving coffee. And that play of words changes everything, changes the way you look at your business, the way you look at what you do for a living. It's about my, for a barista, it's like what I do, a great cup of coffee and done well can change how somebody has, you know, can uh, they have a different morning. Uh, you can either make or break somebody's morning experience through a great cup of coffee. So it's we're not in the coffee business serving people; we're in the people business serving coffee. That that flipping that and those uh, principles those principles are so true. I mean, that's a fact of coincidence. Yesterday, I was with a barista uh -huh. who who was a very good barista. She's now left being a barista. But I we got in conversation. I said to her, "What are they?" Because I always actually ask people these questions, mm, and I curious. said to her, "What is it that yeah. you think makes a fantastic barista? Mm -hmm. Is it the person who can make the machine create the most noise for the longest period of time?" That's what I said to her, <laughs> and she and she said, "Well, that's part of it, Jeremy." She said, oh, "She said, I, I she thinks." Making a great cup of coffee is is really critical. Mm. You said anyone can do that. She said mm. it's so it's so it's the machines do that for you. Now she said what really matters is how you engage with the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know how much you care. These are what we call the soft. These are what we call the soft skills. We're hearing right. that now, aren't we? Yep. The, the technology is 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 the hard stuff. Uh huh. There's so much focus on the robotics, the automation, and the, yep. and the scaring stuff, the the, mm -hmm. the negative side of the crisis, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Will there mm -hmm. be jobs? But there will be jobs, but there will be different jobs. But what's interesting now is that the soft skills, all the things we talk about, releasing talents, engaging people to co-create mm -hmm. the future. Mm -hmm. And the third one is is bringing out appreciation at scale into your organization. So you build appreciation into the daily rhythm of of, of work as the rhythm of 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 kindness, thanksgiving, kindness, mm -hmm. gratitude, and thanksgiving, which mm -hmm. I'm doing now with a number of organizations using a digital app to do that, extraordinary. Mm -hmm. But these are the soft skills. The leaders now and the change makers need to be re-equipped with the soft skills. And of course, soft is such an inadequate word, isn't yep. it, now to describe mm -hmm. yep. what this is. I think we have an opportunity to be human again. We have uh, the exactly. yeah the opportunity to do what matters the most. What uh, what our strengths are with all these the three Ds: the dull, the dirty, the dangerous jobs being taken over by machines, is going to free up a lot more time for us. A lot more energy. We'll have more. And so, what are we, the question? Big question for leaders across the world right now is: What are we going to do with that additional time? That additional talent? that additional energy we have available. Is it going to go waste? Is it going to turn towards drugs and gambling and all the vices in society? Or will the leaders mm -hmm. of the new world be able to harness that and solve some of our biggest challenges? That really is. And I think I, I think of a seesaw, mm. you know, a simple seesaw with 
the two M's, money and meaning. Mm, indeed. You know, which, Balancing act. Because, because uh, we have a choice now. It was Carl Swartz, the, Swartz, the uh, chairman of the World Economic Forum, mm-hmm. who said two or three years ago that this technology now is of such magnitude that gives us a choice. Mm-hmm. I call that which which the two streams we take. So we've got a choice as leaders. Mm-hmm. We either, we either focus on the money or we focus mm. on the meaning. If we focus on the meaning, there'll be enough money. Mm. And we've if already we made the, the money, we've had corporations. There may not be enough meaning. Right. And we, we have corporations sitting on trillions of dollars of cash, trillions of dollars of cash. So we've done that. We've, 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 we are there. That's a mountain we've already scaled. We've already climbed. The question is, despite that, there are still huge problems, not only in the business world, in the world that we live in, environmental, uh, human rights, so many other things, liberty, fairness, equality, despite having, so there's no shortage of money as such. I'm reminded of an old um, American Indian proverb which said, once we've, uh, uh, we've polluted all the rivers and, you know, and we've uh, cut down the last tree, human beings will come to the realization that we cannot eat money. We cannot eat the, the dollar bills. Well, let me share this with thought with you. It's a, you're making a very, very powerful point here. Mm-hmm. Um, one phrase that I've been using recently with my work, I've been working with the bushfire affected communities of, of East Gippsland who were hit very hard by the bushfires. Mm-hmm. And we've been shift, using a priest inquiry to shift the conversation from resilience and recovery to reimagining vibrant futures. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, what, one of the things we, we, we've, we've, we've talked about there is, is, the, the importance of being, and this is what they came up with in their priest inquiry summit room. What would what would the future state look like? So, the f- I think it, it, what was powerful for me was the idea that this most 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 leaders have been taught you got you got to come up with doing outcomes. Mm-hmm. In other words, you've got to have a meeting. You've got to have a result, which mm. is a, a, increase the business by X, create this new product stream, whatever. But what we're seeing now is, is particularly with these young generation Gs, they're crying out for a new conversation around being first before doing. Mm-hmm. So what will be the new being states? Human being. Right. We're human beings, not human doings. Agreed. And I think one of the things that came out very powerfully from a series of conversations I've been running this last 12 months with leaders to look and imagine the new state, it's the being. If we can create the new capability of being, mm-hmm. we can put it to any doing we want. Mm-hmm. Right? Indeed. We can create any doing Mm -hmm. if we get the being right and one of the things about the being which i've seen is how do we use the new technology in ways that we can be more intimately engaged in our own local communities Mm -hmm. to make our communities better places right how can we do what we need to do together in our own community around climate change or homelessness or hunger or poverty Mm -hmm or mental health or whatever, and yet at the same time being globally connected. True. I don't think you, and I think the young kids now want that that sense of authenticity from the leaders. I know one leader who is uh, the senior change leader for a global um, crypto, sorry, a, a, a global uh, cybersecurity company mm-hmm. that went to, to Poland recently on, on and to hire new talent because Poland's a, there's some key hotspots around talent. Poland's one of them for tech. And he, he's, he's talking to me and I was talking to him about how engage your people around why and what the social good causes they care about. Mm-hmm. He was sort of half laughing. But when he got there, he asked, he did his blurb and he had some very smart people from Poland there, some young kids, very, very smart people, young people. And he then opened the conversation and said, so what would you what would you like to ask me now? He said, and they said in their Polish accent, I can't do it. They said, mm. Mr. Mr. Michael, where are you engaged for in social good in your own community. Mm. He said, what do you mean? Mm-hmm. He said, what are you doing about the homeless in your town? Mm-hmm. What are you right. doing about hunger uh-huh. in your town? Uh-huh. And, he, and he called me after he came back from Poland. He said it rocked his world. They didn't want to talk about the comp- compensation benefits or the mm-hmm. packages or the nice, the fitness club. All mm-hmm. those things are taken for granted now. Mm-hmm. They're not the mm-hmm. things that matter. Mm-hmm. Of course, they matter in one sense. You know what I'm saying? But what really matters is are we being, are we living to a single truth? Do I work for an organization that will allow me mm-hmm. to, to see life and work together? This is the fun, bringing this together. The new future work is life and work converged. 
Indeed. not separately. Right. And we need to win back their trust. And I, as far as youngsters go, I think there's a huge yeah. level of mistrust that has happened between what leaders have spoken about in the past and not followed through or concerns that were right in our face uh, that we needed to address, that leaders needed to address, but have been ignored long enough. So I think uh, one of the most important things, most important priorities for um, corporate leaders at this point of time is to win back the trust of the, of the especially the young generation so that that bridge is uh, created, of the bridge of understanding is created, and these important yet difficult conversations can actually happen. Well, you do that by being authentic. Yep. You do that by being real, and you do that being grounded locally in your own mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. Michael said to me when he came back from Poland, what should I do? I said, well, do you, you live in a community. What do you care about? And, and, and he's been switching on his global stuff. He said, I actually care about there are some young kids here who are doing it tough at school and, and they've come from tough backgrounds. And mm -hmm. me and a couple of mates of mine have thought about doing something about it, but we've been so busy. Mm -hmm. I said, really? Too, too busy to do that? Mm -hmm. Anyway, the result is he ended up uh, talking to his mates and they've now come in and got uh, some some extra schooling and, and formed a, 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 a like a sort of an older brother mm -hmm. or, or, or sort of substitute dad sort of figures for these young kids. Mm -hmm. Mentor, guide. And he said, I've now I'm now talking to young talent about what I'm doing and they're listening to me. I said, of course they will. Mm -hmm. You've changed the, course, that's, you, you have re this reframed. This is the future of work, mate. Yeah, you, you've yeah. reframed uh, your recruitment process. Now they're going to come to you, yeah. say, hey, can we work yeah. for your company? Because we've heard about it and we, we see the good work that you do in society. So the old model definitely is uh, d desperately needs to be refreshed. To We need to reframe it, take a fresh look at it. It's been such an uh, interesting conversation here. We originally planned for 30 minutes. It's 50 minutes into the conversation and it was just free-flowing, candid and natural. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Jeremy today. I really appreciate that and you sharing your wisdom freely with us. It's It's been an immense pleasure. Uh, my pleasure. Thank you so much.